I'm back, and in today's video, we're going to check out some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. Eels are the craziest things ever. I hate them. Because we don't know, like, how they're born. What do you mean? Wait, what? They don't have reproductive organs, mm -mm. one. So these eels, they'll live in lakes and rivers and stuff. And then, like, once a year or something, they'll go out into the ocean mm -hmm. and go deep, deep down to the ocean. Like into trenches and stuff. And then more eels will come out of the bottom of the ocean and back into the rivers and lakes. And then that just process repeats. But they've never been able to observe how eels are born. They're just intensely private. There's yeah. no way we don't know. We don't we know. Have to. I think you never see a eel being born. Eels are terrifying. How do they produce electricity too? Yeah. Do they or is that from animation? That's yeah, no, they no, do. No, no. So maybe yeah. it's not electricity, maybe it's just like poison that feels like electricity. No, they put off a current. I did not have a single clue that they did not know how eels reproduced or were born. I'm going to have to do a quick Google search on this just to make sure. Give me one second. Search. So doing a quick Google search, not too sure if it's a super accurate one, but apparently in 2023, scientists, they observed on how the females lay all their eggs and how they get fertilized. So this is not quite accurate, I don't think. Leave me a comment down below letting me know if there's another form of eel that they're talking about. That, that is pretty crazy to think that we have no clue where eels are coming from. History is so much different than we've been taught. There was once a civilization that was wiped out because it threatened the profits of the oil industry. The Tartarian Empire was a society where they had discovered ancient knowledge about farming atmospheric energy. They incorporated special coils into all of their architecture, and their entire society was powered for free. They had also discovered how to manipulate frequencies and move objects, which allowed them to build beautiful architecture. This is the same technology that the ancients used to build the pyramids. This society was far better than what we have today, as free energy allowed for people to focus less on work and more on creating a strong society. These people flourished for years until they tried to spread their technology. The oil oligarchs recognized that free energy threatened the profits they could make from oil. For years, they slowly destroyed the society and rewrote history as if they never existed. This technology was hidden and is now likely located in the Vatican archives, along with tons of other advanced knowledge. So the past couple of days I have not been posting on YouTube, I've been doing other things outside of YouTube, but I've still been watching some of these videos, that's why I have a lot, and this video is probably going to be kind of long because I'm going to be playing a lot of things that I've collected over the weekend. And in doing so I've run across a lot of Tartaria stuff. A question that I've thought of since I've been watching these Tartarian videos is if we had technology that allowed us to live free and to basically do what we want, how did we let that technology go? I, I feel like if we had such technology that it allowed us to be free, that we would not easily just let that go and be erased through history, you know? That's a big question that I have. Things that can't happen have happened here. The site is built 12,000 feet above sea level. This is very oxygen poor air in which the slightest exertion can cause nausea and worse, and yet blocks of up to 200 tons were maneuvered over distances of up to 90 miles in rarefied air. This is not possible by muscular strength. This grand complex was built with a technical skill embarrassing to us and by a method which is totally unknown to us today. With truncated pyramids, artificial hills, lines of monoliths, platforms, underground rooms, and giant gates, which incorporate architecture beyond our technical scope today. Many large gateways were built from a single stone. The Gate of the Sun is the biggest carved monolith in the world. It is a single block of rock, 10 feet high and 6 feet wide. Many of the great buildings were dynamited, and then untold treasures disappeared. One 24-foot statue remains but the records are there. You see, when the Spanish got there, they made records of it. And then they tore them down, blew them up to salvage the gold, silver, and the metals shipped them off to Spain. Here's the point. Here are buildings at 12,000 feet in Bolivia that we could not build today. 
let alone at 12,000 feet. And we're being told, you know, in our movies and in our books, that these great monuments were built by slave labor, and they were built by hand, without wheels, without pulleys, just by pure muscle. That's preposterous poppycock. You talk about fantasy world. Hey, you talk about fairy tales. That's a fairy tale. You know, in Job 38, verse 24, we read a scientific question. It says, by what way is it that the light is parted? Or paraphrased, it says, by what way or technique is the light apportioned or separated? Can you imagine asking that question 4,000 years ago? It is, of course, today a simple one. And the student instantly answers, well, by passing it through the prism of the spectroscope. But who could have known that 4,000 years ago in Job's day? And since it's manifestly impossible for any human mind to frame a question that the mind knows nothing of, a greater mind than the mind of Job is the questioner here. But when we heat a metal red hot or heat any substance until it's incandescent, it gives forth rays of light. These rays, after passing through the prism of the spectroscope, divide themselves on a graph according to the content of the matter that sent them forth. So when a ray of light reaches us from some far-flung star, it need only to pass that ray of light through the spectroscope to see the composition of that star and the proportion of each of its ingredients. This division of light rays is always constant. It doesn't vary in the least particular, so that we may always rely upon its results. It's called spectroscopic analysis. And this is the manner by which the light is apportioned. Now, this places us in a quandary, because either Job knew this, or we're dealing with a supernatural wisdom here. You know, it's one thing to say, well, yeah, we could duplicate that today, but when you've got monuments out here, as I pointed out last time, you've got a block of rock that weighs 200,000, not 200 tons, 200,000 tons, which is five Queen Marys. Somebody quarried that block of rock and then moved it and set it in place. There isn't anybody in the world today that can do that. There are pyramids in the world that are bigger than the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Now, if you're like me, you know, you heard that the Great Pyramid of Egypt is the biggest pyramid in the world. Down in Mexico City, 40 miles out of town, there's a couple of pyramids called the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. I saw those as a kid, you know, I was about 20 years old or so. I went down there and I looked at those pyramids, and oh my God, these two pyramids look just like the pyramids over in Egypt. How could these people over here in the New World be building pyramids that look just like the pyramids in Egypt, unless they had had some kind of communication? The pyramids are in China. They're in Australia. They're in the United States of America. Did you know we got nine pyramids over here in the United States of America, sitting over in Illinois? I never read about those pyramids here in the United States when I went to school. I never heard a word about them. My wife is from Illinois, and she said, have you ever heard of the pyramids in uh, Illinois? I looked at her like, pyramids? She says, yeah, they're, they're about the same size as the Great Pyramid of, of Cheops in Egypt, and there's nine of them in Illinois. And I looked at her like, lady, you got to be out of your mind. There's no pyramids in America. If there were, I would have heard about it when I went to school. And she said, well, turn left here. Let's go take a look at one. So we drove out into the countryside. And uh, here's this great big mountain. There are parks. You know, the, the state of Illinois have, has a park there. I climbed to the top of one of them. The top of the pyramid, the top of this pyramid in Illinois, is one half acre in size. That's the top. The top is a half an acre. It's bigger than your house. It's bigger than your lot. And somebody packed all that dirt up there. I'm telling you, boys and girls, that if you had to go out here and build that pyramid today, if you called the Caterpillar Tractor Company, you'd have to have a major contracting outfit like Guy F. Atkinson to come out there and build something like that. You know, we look at it and we say, oh, it's with a bunch of baskets carrying dirt, uh, stacked it up there. There's no Indian tribes around here ever claimed that they built that thing. It was there when they arrived. That's what they're telling them. I've been to Illinois. I've never heard of a pyramid being there. If there's anyone watching in general, and if you live in Illinois, do you know about this pyramid? Because I would like to hear a little bit more about it because that is pretty interesting. I do find it extremely fascinating that there's pyramids all across the world, and there's probably pyramids that we're completely unaware of because we just think that they're mountains or hills, and they're, and they're just overgrown with trees and grass. I've always been extremely curious to be able to like take a scanner out there into the mountain range and just scan the environment to see if we can't find something that's deeper underground that we just 
do not realize that, hey, that was actually a building at one point in time, or a pyramid. But yeah, anyone in Illinois, please let me know. Have you heard of this pyramid? Have you seen it? Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this every day. And to everyone that's subscribed to the channel, thank you so much for being subscribed. And to everyone that's not subscribed to the channel, I still appreciate you nonetheless. Thank you for watching. And don't forget, if you want to be a part of Questions for DK where I answer personal questions, questions about conspiracy theories or theories in general, leave a comment starting with Question for DK so that I can find it in YouTube search results and answer those questions in a future video. India landed on the moon. They're the first country to land on the South Pole. I'm interested to see what they find because cool. no one's ever been there. Yeah, that's a really big deal. What if it's Whoa. fake? It could sure. be. I don't want to like stir something up, but like people say we haven't gone to the moon. We have a lot of really great footage from that time, but India could only afford the little tiny little That's so them. true, like, It's dude. like, come on, what are we doing here? Well, I saw something on it that it took less money for India's research team to get to the moon than it did to make the movie Interstellar. And like, it cost like $30 million less. And they beat Russia to it. Yep. Because Russia was trying to do the same thing and they crashed. And I, Russia's thing blew up oh onto no. the surface did, of the moon. Did you see the headline that they put out? Russia Unmanned. Out? Headline was like, it uh, had like an unexpected um, landing on the moon. And it's like, so you crashed it. Right? PR the person. It, yeah, I was like, yeah. how, did we, how do we twist this? It was an uh, <laughs> unexpected landing on the uh, moon. That's yeah. big time, though, for them. <laughs> yeah. They, they, I feel like they needed to win. India needed this, guys. It makes me wonder one, is there really a moon? Because that's just a question that's always been out there. I do think there is. I do believe space is real. But again, it makes me wonder, why are all these other countries, why are we trying to get to the moon so much right now? Why did we not focus on that in the past when we were there the first time? We could have progressed so much by now if we would have just continuously went to the moon and just built. I do theorize that we are still on the moon, that we actually have business up on the moon, and that's why these other countries are starting to go that way because they're also probably building different factories and things like that on the moon. I have a feeling that America does have some kind of workstation or some kind of warehouse on the moon, and why not have something on the dark side of the moon where nobody can see it? It's the most secretive place in the world, really. So I just always think that all these countries are going to the moon because there's business up there and we're starting to make business deals with them. You know, as long as they make it to the moon, they fund their own time to get to the moon, they can start building on the moon and being a part of that system. Big theory I have. Many people feel like their religion alone is right and that other religions are wrong. Here is a story to demonstrate how religions work and why in fact every religion is actually valid as a means to arriving at the same truth. So imagine there's an elephant in the story. The elephant obviously represents God or the divine reality or the absolute truth or whatever you're choosing to call it. Now imagine that there are five blind men and each of them is touching a different part of the elephant. If the elephant is God, then these five blind men are all mystics. They're each and every one of them experiencing a particular aspect of that God. Now remember, religions are not actually founded on belief. Religions are founded on the experience of mystics. So mystics all over the world have had some direct first-hand encounter with divinity and then they make their religious claims and then religion is formed. So in each of these cases, it's a mystic experience in God. So back to our story. So each of these blind men are touching a part of the elephant. Now the one that's touching the elephant's leg might say something like, oh, this elephant, it's like a, a, a pillar. It's round and it's hard. Then the man that's touching the tail might say it's bushy, kind of like, kind of like a fan, like one of these things. Then the man that's touching the elephant's trunk, well, I hope he's touching the trunk, might say something like, well, the elephant is long and, and, and small. <laughs> and then the one that's touching the elephant's tusk might say, actually, the, elephant's, the elephant is sharp and hard. And the one that's touching the elephant's body might say the elephant is solid and flat like a wall. Now, in this story, each and every one of these mystics is actually touching the elephant. Every mystic in the world has actually experienced some aspect of God. But notice how they can all be wrong and all be right at the same time. If you ask any one of them what God is, well, they'll say something like God is a pillar or God is a fan 
or God is like a snake, or God is like a wall, or God is like um, a sharp, hard thing like that. Each of them is right. But notice, God can be so much more. God can be all of these things, and God can be so much more besides. So someone might touch God and say, God is Krishna. Another person might touch God and say, God is Kali. Another might touch God and say, God is the formless reality. Nirguna, Nirvishesha, Brahman. Another person might touch God and say, it's Jesus. Another person says, it's Mother Mary. Another person says, it's... Um, the formless father, uh, you know, and, and, and so another person might say it's Allah. Each and every one of these people are using different names to describe different aspects of one reality. In truth, God is all of these things and God is so much more besides. Because importantly, if God is really unlimited, if God is really infinite, then there must be unlimited, infinite ways to reach God as well as to enjoy God as well as to express God. So let me give you another example. Imagine that there is a, a, a body of water, like a river or a lake or something like that. Now, some people get water from that same lake and call it, let's say, water. Another person might get water from that same lake and call it agua. A third person might get water and call it jal. Now, it's the same water. They're each of them using different names to describe it. That's what all the religions in the world are like. But whether you call water Krishna or Kali or Jesus or, or Allah, the fact of the matter is it will quench your thirst all the same. The mystics of the world don't argue what to call God. They're too busy experiencing God. They don't argue what to call water. They're too busy drinking. One person's interpretation of our God is their God, and it seems different, but overall it could be the same God, right? I don't know. It's an interesting concept, and I, I kind of like it. Let me know what you guys think of this, and to the people that do not believe in God, that's totally understandable, but this is still a really interesting way of thinking about it, I would think, as well. I, I really enjoy listening to people's explanation on religion and how it all formulates around one purpose, if you will. And the weird thing is, Joe, this is the linchpin. This is the finger out of the dike. You know, the JFK witness list, they say it's 200 people they knocked off to keep that a secret. 9-11, 3,000. Maybe they killed 20 people to cover it up. Even though it killed the fewest number of people, it's the one that will enrage the public the most if they find out. Because they waved their flags, they got down on their knees and prayed, and they cried. They gave them medals of honor. They printed it on stamps and coins, and they taught it in school. The glorious moon landing. If the public, this is what the NBC News director tried to get me to understand, which I didn't understand until recently. If the truth comes out, it will bring down the corruption. Let's look at the Apollo 11 post-flight press conference because this is a weird one. They look like they're in a hostage video. It does not seem like these are happy guys who just returned from the moon. Here we go. So look how nervous they look. Look at Michael Collins fidgeting. And obviously you would be nervous. You're addressing all these people. But it's the tone in which Neil Armstrong takes. Here we go. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us, okay. the, the flight, as you know, started promptly. And I think that was characteristic of, of all the events of the flight. The Saturn gave us one magnificent ride in, in the boost as well as the subsequent phases this is going to go on for a long time yeah one and interesting so thing to note there you see the two teleprompters there in mm -hmm. the desk these are the only guys on earth who know what it was like to walk on the moon and yet they're being prompted on how to answer the questions um it, they just look very odd sorry some of these clips are a few days old now i know i'm, I'm catching up from my break that i was on S still very interesting episode of joe rogan i i've not seen the actual whole episode i've just been catching the clips here and there on tiktok but i've seen that clip with all of the astronauts sitting in that room talking about their experience and it really doesn't look comfortable at all something seems off they act as if they're either ashamed of what they're talking about because they know that they're lying or they're exaggerating what they're talking about because they really did go to space, but everything that we are seeing is just Hollywood effects because they really couldn't film it 
because it was not that easy of a task, you know? There's so many theories that bounces around in my head on this because I really want to believe that we had astronauts go to space, land on the moon. That sounds amazing to me. It doesn't seem real when you actually look at it, you know? It's, it's, it's so fake looking and it just looks really off. I can't wait for the day when the actual truth is revealed. We either need to be able to go to the moon to say, all right, someone's been up to the moon in the past, or, or they need to just come out and say, hey, it was fake. That way, something can be thought of, but if they come out and say it's fake, NASA's gonna go crumbling down, and I don't think that'll ever happen. Scariest conspiracy theories in the world that will seriously change your life. The egg theory. This is just straight up terrifying. And you, my friend, are about to become a god. The egg was a story which was published by Andy Weir back in 2009, but this theory has existed for a long, long time. So in the story, there is two characters, a younger man who passes away, an older man, and God. Now, when this man passes away and comes face to face with God, God says that he is going to be reincarnated. But not in the future or in the present day, but in the past, back in the Chinese dynasty. So every single time this man passes away and gets reincarnated, he's in almost a different timeline. Now, stick with me. The egg theory is actually a pretty popular theory that a lot of people do believe, especially people that believe in reincarnation. It is essentially the theory that when we die, yes, we do get reincarnated, but we get reincarnated so many times to the point where we are reincarnated as every single person that has ever lived. So we basically get to try every single person's life. So people during the war in the 1940s, every single person. In the Egyptian times, the Roman times, still in different countries, in different situations around the world right now. So when you die and come back to life reincarnated, you may be living now in Afghanistan or somewhere else in the Middle East, who knows? So you have to live as every single person that's ever existed and work your way up, essentially, from the bottom to the top to the point where you can actually become a god. Make sure you hit that follow button, the series is going to get a whole lot crazier. I will see you guys in the next one. I've actually heard of this before and I find it really interesting. Just the simple fact that everyone that you come across is you at a different point in time of reincarnation. You just haven't experienced it yourself yet that that to me is a really mind-boggling thing but it but it's super interesting and cool because you literally are getting to experience the life of everyone you get to experience the best lives that some people have and you get to experience the worst lives that some people have you really get to go through every single being life and that just sounds like once you've done that you would become extremely knowledgeable in the fact that once you have lived everyone's life you become a god that's where it starts to crumble apart for me a little bit because if that's the case then what happens when everybody experiences everybody's life cycle and they become that one god what happens then? Is there a life outside of this realm when you become a god you get to live that life and it's a whole nother journey of some sort or what do you do you just create a world for people to just endlessly run a cycle through until they become a god because that's where it starts to get a little a, a little fishy for me because now the story is starting to not make sense if you have a way to sum it up or what the after effects of becoming a god would be please leave a comment down below letting me know because it's an interesting theory. I really enjoy this one. It's a fun one to think about. 1920 is when everything pretty much changed. They started changing every single thing. They started removing certain parts of the history. They started rewriting the history. 1920s is about that time. Educational system started changing everything. Rockefeller educational system. So if you find books, you want to find books before 1920s. Because if you don't find books before 1920s, you're usually being told a bunch of nonsense. And you look at a lot of the, the, a lot of the free energy books too, and everything related to the ether, that's before 1920s. The ether was removed from the periodic table after 1908. Every book you look into, it talks about ether and terrestrial magnetism and all of these things. 1908, that was removed off the periodic table. And that was removed so that people would not believe in the ether. They would think it's woo-woo. They would think it's pseudoscience. Those are all terms of the Rockefeller educational system. Coming up with terms to debunk the truth and debunk what we were once connected to. Then when you get rid of ether, you get rid of everything related to the fifth element and the quantum, you get rid of all of that. And then you make up a whole new narrative and you remove all that so that when you can't explain something, you just say, I don't know what it is. I took a remote viewing course with Major Ed Dames, Project Stargate, former CIA, and he told me that 
there's beings that have easy and free access to come and go as they please from Antarctica. They, they come and go as they please because nobody can stop them. Very interesting. Yeah. I believe that they were trying to tap into time travel so that they can go back in time and change the past. My hypothesis is that part of the work going on is to learn how to create stable wormholes. What Einstein and Rosen called an Einstein-Rosenbridge, where you take space and you fold it and make a hole, punch a hole in between to make a connection, a shortcut through space time. We have a new enemy that can fly from pole to pole with extreme speed. There's an incredible story that was in, in uh, Admiral Byrd's diary that was found by his kids. Something took over his plane. I recently had this video go viral and the comments are so funny to me. The video starts out by me sharing public knowledge, Nobel Prize winners in 2022 for physics won that prize because they proved quantum entanglement. Entanglement proves that object permanence does not exist, aka reality has no fixed and predetermined state until you measure it. The whole video is about how objects are not locally real until you observe it. Reality does not exist until it is being observed. That is what they won the Nobel Prize for. It's a dramatic conclusion that most researchers accept but still fully struggle to grasp. And no one in my comments can grasp it. And I just have a message to you all. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Reality is not objectively real. Nobel Prize winners won the Nobel Prize due to this statement. It's not that I don't understand. It's not, it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Look, I get it. New realities are hard to grasp, especially when they challenge what we feel like is real in our everyday reality. But I will double down. People won the Nobel Prize not only did they prove quantum entanglement, but quantum entanglement has been like a known concept for like literally almost a hundred years. And they finally closed all the loopholes with like 20 years of experiments to prove that it can't not be true. It's not like they won based off one experiment that in a few years we're going to be like, oh, that like wasn't the whole picture. So if you think objects do exist, even when you aren't looking at them, that is literally wrong. That is just literally not true. And I, I, <laughs> I can't help you. I get it's weird, but objects do not exist if you aren't looking at them. Reality does not exist if you aren't observing it. I'm not a rocket scientist or anything like that. So it is an extremely hard concept for my mind to, to wrap around. I really have a hard time believing that when you're not looking at something, it does not exist. That's really hard for me to grasp. If that's the truth, hey, so be it. But I wouldn't think it's because we live in a simulation. I just think that things around us are different. Possibly the theory for me would be everything is an atom and those atoms all vibrate at a certain frequency. So when we see them with our eyes, those frequencies are vibrating at just the right level for it to create an image that we understand, like, like this wooden cabinet. I know that this is a wooden cabinet because maybe those frequencies and those atoms formulate that wood and it makes it look like that and it feels like that. But when I'm not looking at it, like for example, I'm not looking at it right now, but my camera can see it and I can see it in the camera. And as a viewer, you can see it in the camera. I, I think there's a lot of people that do not like this theory. I like it. I just think that it's it's not exactly what we think it is. I think that it has something to do with atoms and their frequencies and how we perceive them. And everyone perceives them pretty much the same way. Let me know in the comments your thoughts about this because it's a pretty interesting theory. Have you ever wondered what triple washed means on your organic lettuce? They say we washed it three times. What did you wash it with? It's chlorine bleach. Let's go down the rabbit hole. According to Consumer Reports, triple washed or ready to eat greens typically are rinsed to remove dirt, debris, and grit, then washed in water that contains chlorine or another sanitizer, and finally rinsed. But this doesn't necessarily get rid of the bacteria that can cause food poisoning. So you like pre-washed lettuce mixes? The FDA encourages lettuce to be washed with a bleach solution to kill harmful bacteria. The greens are treated with a mix of water and a food-grade sanitizing agent like chlorine. 
The problem is traces of bleach are left on the lettuce. Chlorine produces free radicals in the body, which trigger cell damage, and they are highly carcinogenic, even in small amounts. Take note. They're telling us plain as day, they're not hiding it, that they're bleaching your lettuce, and they're telling you that bleaching it doesn't even get rid of all the bacteria or any of the bacteria, as well as the E. coli. So you really need to ask yourself, what is the purpose of using the bleach? Can't you just use a water solution to rinse the dirt off of the organic lettuce? Right here, our beloved FDA encourages to wash the lettuce with a bleach solution to kill harmful bacteria, but it doesn't kill it. So at this point, man, we really need to understand that they're getting us at every level and we have to educate ourselves about everything that goes in our mouths. We need to know where it comes from and what they're spraying on it. Yeah, that's crazy. I can't stand that. That is horrible. And, and the fact that it's not even killing all of the bacteria, it's not actually cleaning it fully and thoroughly. It, it, at that point, it's like, what is the point? Because you could just have a whole team wash it as it goes down the conveyor probably be more effective that way i, I don't know though i'm not 100 percent sure as far as storing and how the produce works in that matter i normally try to tend to doing as fresh as possible unless it's out of season then i might do canned foods as well if there's any way for you to be able to shop at a farmer's market or someone that actually sells fresh produce that's the best bet. It can be kind of expensive though sometimes, but always try to keep in mind, if you can find local produce, that's the best way to go, I think. It's magical. If you really want to decalcify the pineal gland, you do what I'm doing right now. It's absolutely free, which is sun gazing. It's something all of our ancestors always did. I don't know, I can't scientifically say if the sun is giving us some sort of light codes. Fritz Pop, a German physicist, discovered that our DNA emits and receives light. So obviously we're getting some sort of information from the light. Fiber optics is one of the most efficient ways to move the internet into your house. So why would the light traveling through the airwaves not be an efficient way to give us some sort of code, some sort of upgrades, something unlocks inside of your brain. And the stuff that gets released from the pineal gland is the stuff that makes the magic happen. So make sure when you first start doing this to only do it at sunrise and sunset, because if the sun is overhead, it's going to be too hot and it's going to burn your eyes. And you do it when the sun is warm. Man, I really wish that I was able to watch the sunrise. My current time frame, I'm always at work before I can catch the sunrise, which is a shame because my window of my house faces the east and it, it perfectly fits right where the sun rises. And it, it's a shame that I'm not able to actually get to watch it because I do want to start doing this. This would be a really fun theory to test out. I did, I did do some research on Google, but I did Google if it was okay to watch a sunrise, and actually it's really beneficial. It's supposed to boost your mood, help with depression. It's a really recommended thing to just don't stare at the sun directly for too long because it could burn your retinas. I wish that I could do this. This would be something that I would really like to start doing. How about any of you guys? Do any of you watch the sunrise, or is this something that you also would like to do? Because I think this could be very beneficial. Okay, so this is what's going on. This was a spherical object found on a farm in Australia, and they say that they're so scared they won't even go near this thing. And as we know, there's a lot of UAPs, a lot of UFOs, and orbs and things of that nature now. Although this is extremely mysterious, and it could very well be of extraterrestrial origin, we have to, have to consider this. The Lincoln Calibration Sphere. This is a real thing. I've researched all of this to find out the information. There's not a lot of information on that actual uh, spherical object in Australia at this moment. It says, but the Lincoln Calibration Sphere 1, or LCS-1, is a large aluminum sphere in Earth orbit since May the 6th, 1965. It is still in use, having lasted for over 50 years. The, it says right here that the sphere was launched along with the Lincoln Experimental Satellite last two, and you can stop and read the rest of it. Now, if we have a spherical object like this that's in our orbit, uh, eventually could it, you know, come crashing down? But if it's in space, how is that going to happen if it's floating? You know, this is a lot of, uh, you know, speculation and people trying to debunk it, and you know, including myself. I'm going to try to find the actual information. I'm not going to put it out there and say, oh, look, it's an alien, you know, if it's not. Uh, 
So with that being said, guys, do you think that it's this thing that was launched in the 60s? Or do you believe that this, that the farmer found, is of extraterrestrial origin and this might link us to some of the mysterious sightings and mysterious findings that have been happening for many, many decades? Leave your comments. If that really is that Lincoln satellite, that's a pretty accurate de depiction of it and is more than likely what it is. That was a really good find if that is what that is. Other than that, not a single clue. I would really like to know if there's any follow-up to this, I'll try to find it. But I would like to know a little bit more about this. If that's just a random ball that fell out of the sky and it's like that, what is it and how heavy is it? But there's not really a big crater or anything underneath it. So, may so maybe it's really not that heavy. If any of you guys know anything about this, leave a comment down below letting me know because I'm pretty interested. What in the world is going on in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan? I mean, not only do they have all of this craziness going on, but there's also a giant crater that's always on fire. That kind of reminds me of the craters I've talked about in my other videos, if you catch my drift. But this isn't the craziest part. No. The craziest part about all this, even though they have things that look like Lucifer's torch and the egg of Ishtar and a giant plunger, the craziest part is this place is completely empty. And when I'm talking empty, I mean empty. You would be lucky to see one person or one car driving around in this insane city that's mostly made of white marble. The city that has another thing that looks like Lucifer's torch. Just look at this place. Literally the craziest looking city I've ever seen. I mean, if this place doesn't give you major Antichrist vibes, I don't know what does. This is their former president who's wearing a cape and statues with shields of lions on them. You know who's talked about as coming back as a lion, right? I'm not even done yet. There's more. I haven't even talked about these crazy ruins in Ashgabat. These ruins that look like they came from a prior civilization that probably had much better technology than we are led to believe. Technology that I'm willing to guess exists in this city if they're able to offer free gas and electricity. Could it be that they're able to offer free electricity because their city literally looks like a motherboard computer. That's the city. That's the city, and I'll show you. All you gotta do is back up, and you will see that crazy city sitting right in the heart of Turkmenistan. Man, and I thought Asatana, Kazakhstan was strange. This place takes the cake, though. I don't know what's going on here, but it's not nothing. I'll tell you that much. And just to clarify, all of this was just my opinion. It's just for educational purposes. It's just for entertainment. I'm sure this is a normal, totally fine city with nothing weird going on whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, everything that he said was pretty interesting as far as it all looks pretty suspicious. But he said that you'd be lucky to find one or two people in here. And there was a number of people that I seen going on through these slides. So that was kind of like counterintuitive. I do wonder how much it costs to build all that because it is really nice looking. For it to be as empty as it is, how do they have the funds to really be able to construct so much of that? You are all absolutely screwed. <laughs> I can't because this is going too far now. This, this is going too far. We know AI is getting more and more powerful by the day right but now this is just taking the flipping biscuit so we've got Neuralink which passed the trials a while ago the first man is now living with this inside his brain yes it's used for some good but it's still pretty damn terrifying but now yesterday Meta came out and said they will soon introduce devices that breed brain signals so soon you won't even be able to think in private the tax man and everyone will know exactly what you're thinking so if you think about not paying tax you're going to jail for that probably everything is going to be digital when i tell you everything is going to be ai they're going to try and do this whether it takes off or not i don't know but it's still damn terrifying if that's not enough amazon have now developed a thing where you can pay with your palm yeah you think apple pay feels like not spending real money good luck when you just swipe your palm across a flipping cashier all of this is just damn terrifying like the way this is moving so fast i don't know what is going to happen but let me know your thoughts please so many people warned us about ai and still are but are we listening probably not but what makes it even scarier, of course, is the theory of Rocco's Basilic. So if that comes true, then yeah, I guess see you all later.
It's only going to be a matter of time before the next brain implant or the next memory reading device becomes the new cell phone. It normally is, oh, I can't wait to get the new cell phone upgrade and get the next best phone. Eventually, it's going to turn into, oh, I can't wait to get the next brain implant. <laughs> All right, so we are renovating and remodeling our closet. And this mirror was screwed to this wall. And as you can see, it's a completely different color and material, which is so weird. Now, I couldn't get the mirror off um, with this screw because it was like bolted it's, on. It doesn't come out. I like the screw that. is like is permanently it, in uh, there. Wait, it's supposed to all turn. Oh my God, is that a door? <gasps> like this is supposed to turn with the mirror. Oh, what okay. the heck? I thought it was a door. Anyway, so it was like anchored with this string and this tiny like where's the little pick? Look. And then there's something back there. Because when he pulled on that string, something back there like moved. Like that makes like I okay, can feel it. It's hold like hold on. It it seems like a door or something. <gasps> Yo, what the fuck? It's a secret door. Stop! <laughs> Wait a minute. Stop, take that off. Uh, yeah. What the fuck? Oh my god, stop! <laughs> I just got the chills. I, that's why it's a fucking door. It's a, it's a fucking hell? like magical it's a lock. I'm fucking dead. Babe, get your flashlight. Oh my god. <laughs> what is in here? I, ho I hope it's just a pipe or something. Yo, that's a whole room. Whoa, why did they make it so small? Like, why did they downsize this? It's a closet. A closet within a closet. <laughs> Let me see. Look at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a mat. A fucking, like, bathroom mat in there. Oh, my God, that's so creepy. What the fuck? Why did they downsize this? It's a whole this? room. Look, there's even a, a latch. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what that is. That's what that was. That is so creepy. What the What's fuck? behind this door? Dead bodies. Oh my god. He's going into the secret hatch. Oh, it's a shelf. Unless this was like a gun safe or something. I gotta call my mom. She probably doesn't even know. Oh my god. This is so crazy. So, there's the latch, the pulley system. Once you pull this, it pulls the string that is holding the latch, which opens this door. There was originally a random towel bar here, which made no sense as to why there was a random towel bar in our closet. But now it makes sense why it was there, because you would need it to close this door. Uh, well, we removed that. So here is the closet, or I guess the extension of the closet and I guess there's a shelf back there randomly it does not make sense whatsoever why this was closed off it's super creepy for sure uh, yeah I would love to find something like that in my house. That would be amazing. If I ever get a house built, I'm going to have secret rooms all throughout that house because that was awesome. I would probably set up my computer and stuff in there. That would be my computer room. That was really cool to me. I love things like that. That is so neat. That would have been a really fun find, especially if there was still stuff in there. That was probably where they kept like their safe, things like that, because that was very well hidden. Have you heard of Bondo Apes? No. I heard about it from a Joe Rogan podcast. Ah! He mentioned Bondo Apes. It's this this group of apes mm -hmm. that live in the Congo that are they're very mythical. Like there's like some pictures of them, but they're abnormally huge chimpanzees. Oh, I look these up. No. I look up pictures. That the rumor is when they walk, they walk up on their two legs instead of like how Ew. a monkey usually walks. Six feet tall. <gasps> Six feet tall. And their nickname That's how tall I am. Their nickname 
is the lion killers because they supposedly kill lions oh and eat them. They're confused by them because their heads aren't fully shaped like a chimpanzee's, okay. yeah, but they have kind of... features of gorillas. They're almost saying it's like a mixed race Hybrid. between chimpanzees and gorillas. Oh, that's scary. Like they're thinner like chimps, but they're like bulky Caesar. like gorillas. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's that's like so Caesar scary. from Planet of the Apes. Yeah. yeah. No! Oh, dude. No! Turn on my phone so Came back. <laughs> so this is Come in on. the sky. What? I'm talking to the video. It's gone. Oh, no, it's still there. And this is just there. I don't know what. I'm trying to block the light. I wonder what that is. That's definitely a big shadow of some sort. It looks like it's in the sky. It's, but it's probably just a shadow from off the ground somewhere, but uh, that's pretty dense. So let me tell you why Kendrick and a whole bunch of other major artists really don't like Drake. As you can see, Kanye said it pretty perfectly a couple years ago in a remix. Saying, where's Lucian? Serve your master what? You caught a little bag for your masters, didn't you? Lifetime deal, I feel bad for what? That would be this man right here, Mr. Lucian Grange. The reason why Abel Tesfe, aka The Weeknd, is in the position of which he is. Which, let me say, this is for educational purposes only. But what if I told you there's a very dark history behind Lucian? That even Lucian himself has a puppet master. Let's keep in mind, Lucian is the chairman and chief executive officer of Universal Music Group. Oh yeah, the same exact one that's bringing his music back to TikTok. Let's do keep in mind before I go any further though, Mr. Lucian Grange is under pressure from a lot of allegations. Allegations of sponsoring and financing every single one of P. Diddy's parties. Every single party of where P. Diddy's allegations and themselves originate from. Saying that Lucian aided and abetted Combs behavior by sponsoring gatherings where underage girls were reportedly drugged and what? And provided vast sums of money to Combs, who allegedly used it for what? But like I said, the music industry is very dark and there's always another puppet master. This is Mr. Lear Cohen. How do you think Lucian Grange got that position to begin with? Oh, you guessed it, aka the tall Israeli. And of course, Lear Cohen is a global head of music at Google and YouTube. But this man is a very high authority figure in the music industry. Because let's do keep in mind, Cohen worked on the label side of the music industry at companies including Warner Music, Def Jam, Island Def Jam, and 300 Entertainment. But do keep in mind, Lyra Cohen in himself is somebody that Tupac in himself was sketched out about. And ironically, not even two years after Tupac's death, in 1998 and 1999, Cohen brokered the deal to sell Def Jam to Universal, creating the Island Def Jam Music Group, which combined Def Jam, Mercury, and Island Records. And as you can see at that time, artists under his watch at Island Def Jam included none other than Jay-Z, Bon Jovi, Ludacris, and Mariah Carey, just to name a few. All very sketchy artists, but like I said, Mr. Lear Cohen himself is the victim of many allegations including from a CIA agent that confessed the agencies created rap music to fill private prisons. Mr. John Holmston, a retired CIA agent, has admitted on national Russian television that hip-hop was a psyop invented by the CIA in the 1980s and the agency has direct and financed household name artists including NWA, Dr. Dre, Jay-Z, and Kanye West. Kanye tried to tell everybody about this years ago. And of course, nobody wanted to listen. But John Holmston said that our mission was to use teenage angst to our advantage and turn Generation X into a decadent pro-drug and anti-establishment culture that would create uprisings and further division within society, saying that the CIA even infiltrated mainstream radio to promote their music and reach millions of people every day. He also says when it comes to engineering culture, no one touches Lee or Cohen. Holmston admitted Lee or Cohen, also known as the tall Israeli who runs hip-hop, used specific artists like these, I'm sure everybody knows who all of these people are, to gain specific influence in society. See, like it says here, Cohen ended up promoting rappers such as Jay-Z and Kanye West, and more recently brought Migos and Young Thug to prominence. Well, obviously Kanye knew what he was talking about. But see, Kanye himself, alongside John Hobson, stated that the elites have been slowly working on eroding social norms for decades. Enforcing famous black men to normalize the side of men in dresses was a part of the agenda. And here's the thing, right? A music industry executive who was present at the first meeting between the CIA and music industry executives has written a confessional letter detailing exactly what went down on that fateful day in a specific video that is no longer available online. Yeah, I'm sure that's not sketchy in itself, right? Or the fact that John Holmson said that the CIA worked in tandem with music industry elite to create a funnel in which young people would be indoctrinated with brainwashing gangster rap music and then delivered to the highly profitable private prison system. In order to create this funnel, the CIA introduced music industry owners to the private prison industry. See, that's where Time Warner comes in because let's keep in mind, like I stated at the beginning of this video, Leo Cohen himself was a very high authority figure at Time Warner. And as you can see, some of the biggest names in the music industry are in cahoots with private prison owners. And as you can see in 2021, Core Civic, formerly known as Corrections Corporation of America, biggest name in the private prisons industry, contacted 48 states offering to buy their prisons. See, there was one particular requirement of eligibility for the deal. 
saying that an assurance by the agency partner that the agency has sufficient inmate population to maintain a 90% occupancy rate over the term of the contract. And here's the sketchy part that this article paints very well, right? In the year 2012, a mere 232 media executives in the U.S. were responsible for controlling all avenues necessary to manufacture any celebrity and spark any trend. And of course, Time Warner, as the owner of Warner Brothers Records, could not only sign an artist, but since they are also the owners of Entertainment Weekly, they can also put an artist on the cover of magazines by next week. Like it says right here, you think you choose what you listen to, but do you really? Here's the most important part that this article paints very well. BET and MTV are owned by Viacom. When ownerships of these mass media conglomerates is cross-checked with the biggest names of private prison ownership, the largest owner of course Civic, like I just named, formerly Corrections Corporation of America, is none other than Vanguard Group Incorporated. You know the corporation that works very closely with BlackRock and Larry Fink? You know the corporation who basically has the highest shares in every single major corporation that resides out of America? Yeah, that one. Vanguard is the number one shareholder in both Viacom and Time Warner. Vanguard is also the largest holder in the GEO group, the second largest owner of private prisons in the entire USA. Like it says here, the people who own the media and are responsible for putting gangster rap at the center of you culture are the very same people who own private prisons. So you tell me why this deal is a problem. You tell me why major artists really don't like Drake, because I'm pretty sure it's obvious at this point. Drake is what you would call a sellout, and Kendrick truly knows how the industry runs. But you keep allowing yourself to be consumed by those frequencies. Over the weekend, there was a song that came out by Kendrick Lamar, and it was pretty controversial, I guess. I have a theory, though, that it's basically a distraction from something even bigger going on in the world right now. Let me know what you guys think. This is China's rocket launch to the moon to get samples from the far side of the moon. You need to listen to this news anchor as the scientist talks about the rocket and see how convincing this launch sounds. They're launching in the rain first off. Uh, 17 seconds after they, uh, 17 seconds after they talk, there will be the pitch over, change the direction. Right. Uh, right. Uh, see, this is a video captured by the camera mounted on the launch vehicle. Mm. Actually speaking, on the core stage, you can see two of the rocket boosters. Right. Are the cameras infrared? Uh, this is a visible light camera. Visible light camera. Yep. It's fucking so fake, man. Each Rocket engines mm -hmm. with a thrust more than mm -hmm. 120 tons. <laughs> sure. Uh, and the sure. Will work for Watch. Three minutes. This shit is so and fake. Then, yeah. will, uh, this mission will last for 53 days, much longer than the previous mission of the side boosters. Yeah. We have four boosters. It is seven seconds. This is when the green. On the design of the whole 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But they will wait for uh -huh. it, uh, this moment on the second moon orbit for several days. Will be pivotal. Yeah. for the entire mission. Um, there's complicated procedures involved. Are we going to bring you She's all like, the details? Can we just tell government? everybody the truth? Because I am the tired of doing this. The moment that marks the success of the launch phase. Of and is, you know, that's the uh, unfolding of the uh, unfolding of the solar panels. Solar panels. Mm -hmm. okay, oh, yeah. That was really good yes. graphics. And since when? Applause from the control center, and that's certainly another step forward. Yes. So the uh, the uh, the rocket was the sky that minutes, so cloudy. And, the next, the step and the since when did you have nuclear right. uh, clouds in the sky? The ascending phase and its altitude is begin uh, go higher and higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, the we, look at uh, and, and now look at them clouds. The what, a, what a beautiful day! So as I mentioned, the first stage has two rocket engines from the Ooh, car. What's that? Yeah. Uh, and you can see this is uh, not the, the, uh, at this moment we can see the field light of the first uh, first stage. And, is that the, uh, as I mentioned, are they trying to show us the ice wall on the first stage uh, of the YF seventy seven rocket engine? Each have a thrust of more than fifty tons. Whoa. Speaking, uh, that's the already, fucking. Uh, I believe it's already more than 50, the... uh, 50 kilometers uh, high. Uh, that's the fucking uh, 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 the Baltic Sea anomaly, man. Separated. <laughs> she so, sounds uh, so enthused. Uh, as I mentioned, because it's already high enough, we don't need the protection of. Right. I cannot believe. And that's AI. 
That is AI generated. Buzz Aldrin went down there to Antarctica and he made a tweet which got screenshotted and saved by thousands of people, thankfully, before it got deleted the next day. He said that as people down here that were meeting that were facing the ultimate evil and they took him to meet somebody that he calls the master. He said that we have a new enemy that can fly from pole to pole with extreme speed. Why would he make a statement like that? And there's an entire advanced civilization there, including some of the largest pyramids on Earth, right, in Antarctica. Some type of exotic energy was draining his batteries on his cameras. He had to do try three times to get this thing recorded properly. He said exotic energy. The number one place in the world for technology research is right down there in Antarctica. I believe that as the ice is melting, they're finding remnants of an ancient civilization. We know that Antarctica was not a frozen tundra. These guys are pretty shaken up, mm -hmm. you know. You know that from how hard it is for them to talk about what happened, that they went through something. It's pretty clear to see that something happened uh, that affected them in a way that they'll probably never be the same again. What's your favorite conspiracy theory? Lead was not removed from paint because children were eating the paint, but lead was removed because it actually protected us from dangerous frequencies going through the air. That is my favorite conspiracy. Again, this is all silly. This is all just, you know, jokes and for entertainment purposes. It's not real, but that's my favorite conspiracy. How about that? Because why would the government care about kids eating lead, but they don't care about anything else? I mean, they don't care about other toxic chemicals in the water or the food supply or toys, but they had an, they had an issue with lead um, because we know how lead will block x-rays and microwaves and whatnot that's why they have you put a lead blanket on when you go get an x-ray uh, for your dental um x-rays so i love that for that uh that conspiracy though that one and also snake oil salesmen were actually onto something that snake oil was actually healing but uh the big pharmaceutical companies did not want that so then they smeared the snake oil salesmen to then push their drugs um, again, just one of my favorite conspiracies, the lead paint and snake oil salesmen were actually legit and snake oil was actually uh, useful. <laughs> again, just my, uh, my favorite ones. I cannot confirm if the lead paint was good for you or not. I do not know, but I do know a lot of my cousins that used to eat the paint chips back in the day. It probably is for the best for them to not have the lead paint anymore because for some reason, kids I knew back in the day were eating them like they were chips. First things first, I'm of sound mind and body. I would never myself. I have a beautiful little boy and wife, happy little family. I love my life. Also, this is just for gets and shiggles. But now that I'm no longer a soldier, and I don't represent them, and, uh, let's talk about this. Y'all remember this? This little Chinese spy balloon. This Chinese spy balloon that flew over a large portion of our country, which we just coincidentally let it fly over despite the fact that it could have been gathering intel as a spy balloon, but we waited until it crossed and got into waters for us to shoot it down with the F-22 Raptor. It wasn't a spy balloon! Here's another photo released by the U.S. Air Force of it. You wanna go ahead and look at that for a second? It's not a spy balloon. It's one of our satellites. Then why would they tell us it's a Chinese spy balloon? Because they want you to think that this is what our satellites look like. Free floating objects. Our satellites do not float free in space like that. They are sent up with helium balloons. The satellite is the little metal thing with the panels on the side and the middle piece attached to the bottom of this giant helium balloon, which then go up in space. No? Yes. Don't believe me? NASA is the single largest purchaser of helium. So what you saw wasn't a Chinese spy balloon. This was our satellite losing helium, and so it dissented. And as its altitude went down, they were like, oh crap. We have to convince the people this isn't one of our satellites because we have to maintain the illusion that we have superior free-floating satellites. If it was a spy balloon, they could have shot it down at any point and it would have been fine, except for the fact that it wasn't a spy balloon, so they wanted to shoot it down over water away from people. That's why it traveled halfway across our country before they did so. But like I said, this is just for gets and shiggles. Entertainment purposes only, pure speculation on my part. It's not like I worked for a multi-layered air defense system or anything like that. That's actually something I never thought of. The simple fact that we might have satellites floating in space might actually not be floating in space because then again, 
That's NASA's deceit. There actually are satellites, but they're floating high up into the sky to the point where we can't see them, or if we do see them with telescopes, it looks like they're in space. But if that's the case, how are they hiding the balloons? How are we not able to see the balloons when we see the satellites in space? I don't know, but I like this theory. This is a pretty good one. I'd never thought of that. I cannot believe I'm saying this, but we now have genuine proof of time travelers. I'm not joking. This is wild. This is absolutely insane. There is some flipping mental stuff going down on TikTok right now. If you don't know, let me quickly recap for you. So the other day, this legend right here made a video about how apparently he's found a time traveler. Now, this guy is a real estate investor. He doesn't make theory videos or anything, so there's not really any reason to lie about this. It's, it's not, it's completely random. Now, if you look at this video, he's basically saying that, you know, this random guy walked into his house while no one was there, went into the shed, but never came back out. And they had police around and everything. No one was in there. Like, what the hell? And this is all on camera, so it's real. Until the next day where it gets mental, where another guy just strolls out of the hut. Not the same guy, another uh, old guy. Like, look, what the flip? This one guy walks in, never comes out, and this old man comes strolling out the next day. And I mean, they kind of look a bit similar, like, weirdly, right? Now, this guy here as well didn't believe this at first, but is now making videos on it, trying to find out what is going on. And he's actually convinced this is real as well. Did some research right and found this guy right here. Right? He looks kind of similar to the guy that came out of it, didn't he? Apparently that guy used to speak about time travel all the time, saying that it was real and he could prove it. And he died in 2018. That guy right there, and that guy, look pretty damn similar, if you ask me. This is going absolutely mental all over social media, of people wondering what the hell is going on. Is this some kind of just giant hoax from this guy, maybe the other guy's involved? But even if it is a hoax, this is extremely well done, because... I, I genuinely, I don't understand what's going on. Reminds me a bit of the series Dark, where there's just like wormholes in weird places, like it could be in that garage, and maybe if this guy goes in there, he's going to go back in time as well. Honestly, mate, keep it up. I need to see if this is real or not. And hit that follow button. I'll keep you updated. I really want to see the outcome of this, because I've seen this pretty much all weekend. This has been a big video that's been circulating on TikTok. And I'm curious, what's going on here? Because there, if there really wasn't nobody that came out once that one guy came in, who was that old guy and where did he come from, you know? Was he already in there and he was just roomed up in there for a couple of days? What is happening? If any of you have any information on this, please leave a comment down below because I would like to know what was going on. Watch this chick. She got her eyes closed. That dude's got his eyes down. That dude's got his eyes down. Now he's got them back up. Man, there's something really fucking weird going on in this world, man. I'm telling you. I'm telling you targeted individuals, there's something weird shit going on. See that? Did you see that shit with his eye? Did you see that shit? Y'all saw that, didn't you? He moves his eyes like different, like one to the left or right, and the other one to the right to the left at different sequences, not at the same intervals. There's something wrong with this shit. Like that dude's an alien or something. Look. See that shit? See, he blinked one down and had one not blink. See them? They're not in sync. Who can do that? I don't do that shit. Some weird shit. I, I don't know. To me, it looked like there was like a filter effect, some kind of funny filter effect that was going on on that guy's face. It could probably be something with the TV or the camera that was recording, whatever that was. But it looked like there was something going on with a filter or something. People online are absolutely horrified the way this restaurant sauced their food is going absolutely viral. That is a mop sauce right there. True barbecue right there. There is a lot to unpack here. As you can imagine, the internet is upset by this. Some people are saying that if this mop is only used for sauce and food, they personally don't see an issue with this. But me, I just cannot go to a restaurant, honestly, that uses a mop to sauce their food. It's just kind of disgusting just thinking about it. There's also a side online that thinks this makes the food taste better, which I think that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe I'm just overreacting because they don't use this mop on the floor. At least I think. 
I'm going to go side with the internet at this one. This is just kind of disgusting, and this should not be a thing in the restaurant industry. I don't care where this is from. Just ban this and never go to this restaurant. I'm not going to lie. I'd still probably eat all that food. That looked pretty delicious. The only problem I have with a sauce mop is how do you clean the sauce mop? I've seen some people use the sauce mop and clean them with a pressure washer, soap and water at the end of the day, and dry them out in the oven. I've, I've seen some people really go down in a detailed cleaning method for them. Or do you just put it in the sauce and put the sauce in the refrigerator and think that that's fine? I don't want old sauce on my mop, you know? I would like a clean mop each time you sauce it up. I would probably still eat this, I'm not gonna lie. It's gotta be better for you than what you get at most grocery stores. <laughs> How about any of you, if you're meat eaters or anything like that, is this something that you would eat or at least try or would you not be about it because of the mop? And I get it, the mop is pretty disgusting. So I just got something really huge and it has to do with our monetary system and how we're going to become faster, more efficient, faster, more efficient, pretty soon we'll just be exchanging energy. Like Bashar says it's an energy exchange or people said that like, oh, and then the currency of the future is just energy. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean? So the problem is that we think that money gets us stuff or we've been doing that for a while. It's kind of cute. It's like when a, a child gives you a fake dollar bill and goes, can I have that if I give you this dollar? And we'll go, sure. We've been playing money because we don't understand this world. But really, a higher level of what's been going on is our thoughts have been creating our reality. And right now, somebody stitched my video, and I looked at it, and I said, no, nah, it's probably a guy, you know, being very negative about my video, so I'm not going to spend my time. And I said, something popped into my mind that said, good, you're not spending your time on there. You're not spending your energy there. Spending. Like money? Spending our time is like, and spending our attention is like spending money because whatever you focus on the most will manifest and i wanted to spiral and i bet if i could keep spiraling i could manifest more of those mean trolls you know but i'm choosing not to focus on it so i'm gonna think about a cool video to make something i truly desire instead of that experience because that's not fun i truly desire helping people with videos so i'm spending my money making TikToks because I enjoy it and it makes me very happy and but do you get it like like energy is our real currency and it always has been it's always been the value exchange oh wait a minute I just got that there hasn't been a value exchange it's always been a direct connection oh damn so what's happening right now is we have middlemen like the banks and the governments and we're moving into a decentralized world where we don't have any middlemen so we're cutting out the middlemen until we realize something. Oh shoot, we don't need anything at all. Like literally, I don't need to call a friend. I don't need to use money. I don't need to use people. I don't need to use, I don't need anything. I can be or do or have all things because my, my thoughts create my reality because I'm a God creating in the third dimension. That's the end result of currency, baby. No more currency once you realize, oh shoot. We're like Jesus then with no purse he walked around with no purse been a little while since i use this creator's content because she's kind of a little scripty it looks like she's reading a script a lot of the times and i have no problem with that but it makes you feel a little uncomfortable for some reason at least when i'm watching it uh and a lot of people like to make fun of her eyelashes but that's whatever to me her topics sometimes are really good like this one i really enjoyed it it didn't seem like she was reading a script and she brought up a really good point of manifestation. I thought this was good. In my mind, manifestation is a way of doing. If you want something, you can manifest it to be, but you have to act on that manifestation. For example, if you are manifesting that I wish that I had a sandwich in front of me to eat, you can definitely manifest that. You can either make the sandwich or order the sandwich and have it delivered. There's plenty of ways for you to manifest that sandwich into your existence. And that goes for manifesting a car. Again, like I said, it just takes time and effort. Manifestation to me 
is effort and time. And some people would say time is money. Let me know in the comments on your thoughts of manifestation. I, I really think that manifestation is something that you put an effort towards. So the glove on the disc record released by Kendrick Lamar actually ties Drake to the murder of Triple X Tentacion. Also, the jury received points to something that no one's talking about either. But both of these things have something to do with the unaliving of Triple X that Drake was involved in, allegedly. And if Drake keeps going, I fear Kendrick will expose him. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you're a Triple X fan, then you know we have been talking about Drake being involved in the unaliving of Triple X for a very long time. Drake has made many a statements, many a raps, many a bars about being involved in Triple X's death in some type of way. He has more than taken credit for the death of Triple X. Everybody is calling attention to the Ozempic whatever. But let's talk about the Maybach glove and the jewelry receipt. Knowing the lyricism of Kendrick and how close he was with Triple X, I honestly feel he's alluding to the fact that he will expose Drake for what he did to Triple X. The title of the disc before he came out with that album cover where the glove is seen was called 616. 616 was the day that OJ Simpson had his charges brought against him and literally got away with murder in relevance to a glove as well. Literally, the OJ Simpson glove thing was everywhere. So it's clear Kendrick is alluding to the fact that that glove is attached to a murder you guys all saw that it is a maybach glove as well as a maybach uh like platelet under it did you guys know that in 2019 there the track kill my vibe that featured trippy red was supposed to have triple x on it there was a demo for it that never was released the version of the song was first previewed on december 18th of 2020 by a hacker who hacked x soundcloud and began playing private unreleased music he said that this is the last song the two artists the two artists had together that demo was leaked on january 16th of 2021 and included a verse from x's friend and x playboy cardi and xx tentacion never finished the song as well as trippy red for reasons you know he put that together with the glove and the Maybach symbol, and he literally says, Maybach, you won't die. I really feel like Kendrick was alluding to that whole thing. That glove was random AF. Not only that, you had that jury receipt with one of the world's most famous jewelers. Drake's mentioned her in songs. She's literally everywhere right now for her hamburger ring. But the day that Triple X was robbed, not only did they steal $50,000 in cash, they also stole his jewelry. Nine times out of 10, this woman made that necklace. I can find every other piece of jewelry and who it was made by except for the necklace on the day he passed away and those men took it. Drake might want to stop while he's ahead because I fear the next diss is going to go into detail about how he murdered for hire. Period. Yeah, be careful, y'all. Look. Look. You see that shit? You see where we at? We on Golden State, yo. Golden State and Shaw. They out here with the shits, look. Over here stealing people's information and shit. We have a really interesting discovery coming out of Vietnam. Supposedly, these photos were leaked from a discovery they made back in March 2024. And what it shows are two different objects found buried in their jungles. Now they're keeping the matter very hush hush, but supposedly two teams went in there to ex excavate and find these objects. Some are saying it's extraterrestrial, they're UFOs. Um, what they are measuring is about five meters in length each, and they have no idea where they're from, how long they've been buried, uh, and supposedly, when you put them close together, they emit some sort of radio signal. So many questions, but yet it's still questionable as to whether this is a legitimate find or if this is a hoax. I'm pretty sure that's AI generated photos. But if we did find something like that, that would be awesome. Universe 25 might be the scariest experiment of all time. In the 1960s, a lot of people became concerned about what would happen if the global population exceeded global resources, something that we still struggle with today. But one guy, John B. Calhoun, had the opposite concern and wanted to know what would happen to a society with too much abundance. So he put it to the test. He took four breeding pairs of mice and put them in an enclosure with enough space and enough food for 5,000 mice. His question was, what happens to mice when they don't have to worry about food, temperature, space, shelter, or disease, and essentially live in a mice utopia? And the answer was, they got busy reproducing. After 
after 145 days, the population skyrocketed from 8 to 620. With nothing really to do, the mice started to separate themselves into different social groups, and the mice that couldn't find a role in a group withdrew themselves and started to pile in the middle. The groups then started to turn on and eat each other. Mothers simply forgot about or abandoned their young. Most mice eventually gave up mating altogether. With the low birth rate, high infant mortality, and even higher violence, the entire colony went extinct shortly after. The population peaked at 2,200 in an enclosure with enough space and enough food for 5,000. Sadly, I think we would probably do the same if we had such luxuries. I really think that we would probably start tearing each other apart. I'd hope not, but I have a feeling we would over time. You want to hear a scary story? Please. Dyatlov Pass, uh, 1959. These nine hikers from Russia went in, on a hiking expedition through the Siberian wilderness. Anytime they could, they would write a letter back home. And then one day, letter stopped coming in. So they went out there. When they came to the site, the tent had been cut open from the inside out. They went out and they're like, where are these people? They followed these foot tracks and then they saw one dude on the ground who had third degree burn marks on his legs. Another dude that was up in a tree who had bitten off part of his hand that was also dressed as well. When they tested them, they had sparks of radiation on them. One of the people had both their eyes missing. Ew. And then one of the girls, I believe, had her tongue missing. One of the people that by the cave system, their head was completely crushed in. What in the world was this? What did they say? There's a lot of theories. One of the theories that was really creepy was there was like one of the last pictures that they took. Like in the back, you can see that on the tree line, there's this man-like figure that almost looks like a Bigfoot. It's like kind of like peering out of the trees Ew, like this. Stop, Joshua. That's pretty crazy and pretty intense. It makes me wonder though, if it was a Bigfoot or, I mean, they didn't say it was a Bigfoot, but if it was a Bigfoot, how did it do the radiation damage? Like, is it a radioactive creature? Or maybe Bigfoot is a creature from space and they are very radioactive. That would be kind of a crazy theory. That's pretty wild though. I don't know if this is real or not, but if it is, that's intense. The following footage is from a realtor named Chris Jackson. He was showing a home in Bowie, Maryland, and he had to pull out his phone to record it because you wouldn't believe unless you saw it yourself. And honestly, as you watch this video, it raises not only multiple questions, but it makes you feel like maybe they should involve the police. Take a look at this footage. So I'm in Bowie, Maryland today, showing houses. And in 20 years in the industry of going in houses of all types, I've never seen anything like this. Six foot gates, dead bolts, drawing on the wall in the back. So you know it wasn't a dog back there. Air conditioning. Are you serious? I don't know what that could have been. I really don't think that it was a prison because those deadbolts were easily accessible. You could literally reach your hand through the bars and unlock those deadbolts. So I really don't think that that's a prison. Maybe a place for animals, but what's up with the drawings and stuff in the back? Maybe the kids just thought it would be nice to put a drawing in the background for the animal that was in there? I don't know. That one is a little odd. You guys got to check this out. I'm literally biking. It's far from my house. And found something crazy. What? What in the world did I just find? Not only that, but that. Where am I? This is literally not far from my house and I've never seen it. What in the world? What in the world? What in the world? <laughs> I don't know, maybe Egypt's moved into America. It's probably like a mini golf course that they're building or something, or maybe a resort of some sort. I don't know where this takes place, but yeah, that's pretty interesting. I wonder what it really could be. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. I hope you enjoyed the length of this video. I know it was a long one just to make up for the time that I was gone over the weekend. 
I really missed being back because I enjoy making these videos. It's really fun. I really enjoy interacting with you guys every day in the comments. It, it's a blast. And I didn't take a break from YouTube because I wanted to take a break from YouTube. I just took a break from YouTube because there was things that I needed to get done in my life outside of YouTube. And it just had to get done or it would have never have gotten done if I would have done YouTube those days, you know? So I'm back for now. Hopefully it'll be a long time before I need to take another break like that. My computer seems to be running better and everything seems to be doing pretty good. So as always, if you found any of these clips interesting, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day.